For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not futile or fruitless. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own little ones. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you, believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who called you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators or mimics of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So, as always, to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them, or will come upon them, at the last. Amen. Well, brethren, we come this morning to 1 Thessalonians at chapter 2. And there is a background to this chapter, and indeed right the way through to chapter 3. Uh, and the end uh, of uh, the chapter, chapter 3, verse 13. And the context is this, very simply. And we've alluded to it already this morning. Where the kingdom of God is going forward. And Christ is being lifted up as Saviour and Lord. The kingdom of Satan will kick back and fight back. And sometimes the way in which Satan fights back is uh, very messy. Uh, he's a dirty fighter uh, and he will hold back nothing. And indeed he will um, not uh, cease to use anyone that he can use in order to damage the kingdom of God. The context here as we saw in our uh, introductory study in the Wednesday night a couple of weeks ago is that there were many Jews in Thessalonica uh, 
and there are Jewish women and Jewish men and some Greeks, a great number of Greeks, who have constituted this new congregation in Thessalonica. They have been brought to Christ in repentance and faith and they have been added to the church. And that happened in the midst of much tribulation because the apostolic team were attacked immediately uh, by the, the Jews, the Jews above all people, God's historic people. And they uh, opposed Paul and uh, Silas and Timothy. They went looking for them. And of course we know how they stirred up a riot and a mob, went to Jason's house uh, and would have potentially killed him and others, but uh, had to settle ultimately for taking them before the authorities and having them bound over to the peace. Where the kingdom of God is coming, the kingdom of Satan will fight back. And we know, of course, that the apostles had to leave then, or the apostle and his team had to leave. And now that Paul has left, the devil continues to work. He is attacking the believers themselves because they are under tribulation, we're told. Uh, and those attacks, no doubt, are coming from Jews. There are probably believers who have been ostracized from their families. There are believers who probably have no work any longer because their employers have said, we are not going to employ those who follow this Christ. So that's happening at one level. And then at another level, there is a smear campaign going on in Thessalonica by the Jews, instruments in the hands of the devil. And it's against Paul. It's against Silas. It's against Timothy. And that's why you get Paul saying again and again in this chapter, but we did not. We did not. And we did this. And Paul is answering the lies of the devil against um, the ministers of the gospel, the leaders of the church. Now brethren, the devil's tactics do not change. And today he will put believers under pressure, perhaps in our workplace, in our families, in various ways. But also he can put the whole church under pressure because he can sow seeds of lies and untruth and stir up slander and smear in the church against godly men who are seeking to do the work of God's kingdom. And so as we look at chapter 2 this morning, I believe against this background of uh, persecution and tribulation that the church is um, experiencing and the smear campaign that the apostolic leadership is experiencing, what stands out for us as we look at this passage? We see exemplary ministers. Exemplary ministers. And I'm going to apply that also to you who are members because I think we see exemplary members here as they follow their ministers and as they reject the slander uh, and as they um, stand steadfast in the midst of persecution. There are four things that we want to see about these exemplary ministers, thinking of Paul and Silas and Timothy. And this is the time, they're looking back now to the time that they were there, starting, spreading the gospel and starting uh, the church. And so, what does Paul say? Well, the first thing that we see is in verses 1 to 6. Exemplary ministers in speaking the gospel message. These men are exemplary. And they are our examples in speaking the gospel message. They're my example as a preacher of the word. 
and they are your example as witnesses to the word in your daily life. And I want us to note uh, the word uh, speak which occurs three times in this uh, chapter. Paul says in verse 2, we were bold um, uh, in God to speak to you the gospel of God in grueling conflict. That's what it literally is, in grueling or intense conflict. Then verse 4, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak. And then go down to verse 16, where he's talking about the opposition of the Jews. They do not please God, verse 15, or contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. Notice also uh, the emphasis here, which and continuing the theme we saw last week on the gospel of God. They're not speaking stories. Uh, they're not speaking nice platitudes. No, they're speaking the gospel of God. And brethren, that reminds us of something very, very simple, but very important in the 21st century. The gospel of is not a play to be acted out. The gospel is not a musical that people go and listen to, to be sung in a concert. The gospel is not a film or a video to be watched. The gospel is a message to be communicated by word through men and pulpits and through men and women believers in the world. Um, we were bold in our God to speak. Even so we speak, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. <coughs> and of course, these Jewish believers, I'm sorry, the Jewish uh, unbelievers who've opposed Paul, the missionary team, they're slandering Paul in his message. And they're saying, you know this guy Paul, he's just like those guys that come around our towns and they will get up and they will speak on a subject. It could be any subject under the sun and then they pass round the hat and they're in it for the money. And they're in it to get the to impress people, the people will say, wow, what a speaker. And to get people ultimately, as is, will be happening in the next couple of weeks in our election campaign, to say, well, I vote for him or her because they're the ones that can, can uh, they impress me with their words and their policies and what they're saying and they communicate clearly and they're the best. And there was um, that kind of um, circus of speakers that went around towns. They may have been religious. They may have been political. They may have been cultural. And you see what the Jews are trying to do is saying, Paul, Paul, don't get hung up on him. Don't listen to what he said. He's just like the rest of them. And so look at what Paul says. In verse 3, Our ex exhortation, our message, did not come from error. He says this is not just some little pet subject that we talk about, like politics or culture or the Greek language, showing how wonderful it is. Um. No, he says, it did not come from error, nor did it come from uncleanness. We didn't come to um, Thessalonica as some of these other speakers would do to look upon the most beautiful women and to take them for ourselves and to commit immorality with them. You see, that was again part of the circuit of these speakers in that day. And he says, 
nor was it in deceit or trickery. He says, and the word literally here is, we weren't like fishermen trying to bait fish. And it's all down at the end of the day to the skill of the fisherman, whether he lands that fish on the bank or not. Paul says, no, no, that's not what we were about. Look at verse 5. For never at any time did we use flattering words. Look at these when he says, as you know. And that's why he opens the whole chapter as well. For you yourselves know. Verse 2. As you know. Three times he says them. As you know. And you see the way to silence the devil. And his smear campaign. Against the people of God. The church of Christ. Especially if it's shaking the church is to, is to say to the church, well, you know, you know the kind of men that we are among you and for you and to you. And so Paul even goes on to say in verse 5, God is our witness. He's calling God there to confirm that they were men who were exemplary in the gospel message. There was no covetousness. See, that's the money gathering thing that these speakers had. But look at what he says instead. Here's the but. Here's the contrast. No, we came to you. How did we come to you? By whose authority did we come? Were we invited by the local council? Did we come on our own initiative? Did um, somebody send us out? No, he says, we have been approved by God. He goes to the source of their coming. We have been approved by God. And that's that word which means attested. You remember the man, the people who were invited to the banquet? And there's one who couldn't come because he bought a, a, well, basically what we would call a new tractor. And he had to go and try it out. His oxen to see if it was up to the job. Well, that's the word test here. And he says, we have been men attested by God. We've been checked by God to see if we're up to the standard of being his messengers and carrying this message. And God entrusted us with the gospel. And that's why we speak. And he says, you know our calling and our objective, it's not about tickling the ears of the people. It's not about how many votes we can get. It's not about how round or how loud the round of applause is at the end. No, no. We are there to please God. Rather than exemplary ministers in speaking the gospel message. And when you uh, go out to witness, when I preach these things that Paul was not but was accused of being, we must make sure that we are not. We're not out just to impress people or to bowl people over with knowledge, or baffle people. We are there to set before them Jesus Christ. And particularly, Paul's thinking here, the specialist role of the preacher, the minister. And there's something in verse 4 that I think we need to hold on to and be aware of as a church. Who should be in the pulpit on the Lord's day? Can anybody come in and say, well, it's my turn today. Or, I've been praying this week and, you know, or over a number of weeks and God has given me this message and, you know, I want to share it. No, look at what Paul says. Men who occupy pulpits in churches have to be approved. They have to be tested by God. There's a standard that God sets and then they have to be entrusted. And it's what we... Uh, described as a denomination as they have to be trained and approved by Presbury and called then by the church. And when it comes to men who are not in the ministry but are filling our pulpits in times of vacancy or in times of holiday, we still should have a standard that men are tested that they have some level of ability and that they have been entrusted and they're recognized by God through his church to be fit for this role because it is a high calling.
you're unwell tomorrow, you phone up your doctor. And all the doctors are all filled with COVID. And um, the uh, receptionist says, but, you know, I've got a, there's this just a, a trainee nurse here. You know, she could see you and she could diagnose whatever, whatever's wrong. I don't think you and I would be very happy. Because we'd say, well, actually, the pain that I have and the way I feel, this takes somebody who has knowledge and understanding and I don't want to be in the hands of a trainee. Or somebody's no knowledge. And yet, brethren, that can happen in the church. That can happen in the church. And why do we, and why should we have a different standard in the church from what people have in medicine or in teaching? A child went into school tomorrow from one of our families and it was just another parent that turned up because the teachers were all off with COVID and that was going to last for weeks and months. There would be an outcry from parents. Sometimes happens when teachers go off in pregnancy leave. And there's maybe a series of, of sub-teachers, one after another. And parents say, well, this is not good enough. Rightly so. And so, brethren, speaking the gospel message. It is such a glorious message. It is a simple message, but it's a, it is a very intricate message. And uh, it is to be spoken. And it is not to be spoken in a raw way. And it's to be spoken by those approved uh, and by God and entrusted with it. Let's move on quickly to number two. Secondly, we want to see that number one is probably the most difficult. Number two is then exemplary ministers in refusing gospel maintenance. Or if you want a simpler word, I'm trying to get M's here, but a simpler word is gospel support. Okay? Exemplary ministers in refusing gospel support. And we're looking now at the second part of verse 6. We might have made demands upon you as apostles of Christ, but, but, we didn't. What's Paul saying? Well, he says what he's taught elsewhere. The minister of the gospel, the preacher of the gospel, is entitled to be supported by the people of God for that work. It is a vocation. Just like being a farmer is a vocation. Or being a civil servant is a vocation. Being a mother is a vocation. And so you're supported for doing that. So the minister is to be supported. But there are times when Paul will waive his right to that. And he'll say, I'm not going to take support in this situation for some particular reason. Now, if what I am said earlier by way of background is true, that here's believers now who are out of jobs, potentially, because of um, their faith, and you're experiencing all kinds of tribulations, well, would it be right for Paul to come in and say, well, I need my wage? No, it wouldn't. Because here, Paul says, and you see, this is the... This is actually the real, um, the real sense of this illustration. Um, we often take it um, when it's talking about the mother and her children that it is gentleness, and that is true, but it goes further than that. It is this. What mother, when her newborn child is a few weeks old, a few months old, will say, well, actually, you've got to support me. You've got to provide for me. You've got to get up and do everything for me. It's just ludicrous, Paul says. And he says there are times, he says, that's the way I treated you. You were like little babies in Christ. And I come in and I'm the mother uh, that is brought under God, has brought you to birth in Christ. And it would be wrong for me when you don't have what is needed, just like the little baby doesn't have what is needed to demand what I ought to receive. Very, very powerful principle. And you see, you know what it does? It knocks on the head the whole suggestion that Paul was in it for the money. That he'd come to Thessalonica and he put on what had been on a good show in order to fill his own pockets. So Paul says, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother with her children. And he says, in fact, 
We were so concerned for you and your situation that you were in. What did we do? We worked night and day. So during the day, Paul would have gone preaching in the marketplace. And at night then, he worked at his tent making. Almost certainly that was Paul's um, trade, if you want to put it like that, before he became a rabbi. And he says, we worked. And what did we do then? Did we put that one in our pockets? No. We brought, yes, they obviously put some of it in their pockets. And he lived given some to Jason, in whose house he stayed. But he says, look at what we did. We gave it to you in your need. We gave also our very lives. Why? Because you had become so dear to us. You were dear brothers and sisters in Christ. And brethren, there are times when it is right for a minister to refuse gospel maintenance. And to say, I don't want a preaching supply today. I'm not taking a preaching supply today. This is part of what I want to give to you because I love you and I care for you. Equally, it is right that a church should support the ministry when people have ability and they have more than food and clothing and shelter. Paul says then, in that situation, you should give of what you have in order to support the work of the ministry. Those who are blessed through teaching are to share all good things with him who is the teacher. Um, so um, there's this there's a balance to be got here, and we need to know we need to have wisdom to know when to refuse maintenance. And we need to have wisdom, or uh, humility maybe, to know when to accept it. And brethren, there's that principle amongst you as well, and amongst us as members. When we sit, when we, when we consider ourselves together, not a, I'm your minister and you're the members, but we're all members of the body of Christ together. And there'll be times when we will, someone will offer us something, and we recognize that their need is far, far greater than ours. And we'll say, no, absolutely not. You need that for yourself. But there's other times, brethren, and we need the humility to say, thank you. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Thank you for the heart with which this is given to me. And you see, brethren, you and I, as we, as we live together, as a church family, we need this wisdom to know when to say no. And we need humility to know when to accept from our brethren and to give thanks to them and to give thanks to God. And Paul is exemplary in that. And what a thing, what a... What a standard it is that you and I would be exemplary. That other young Christians coming in would be able to say, well actually, those people, they just don't throw their money around them. But equally, they don't hoard it away. And just keep it for themselves. There's a wisdom in terms of how they handle material things. And here I am, a young Christian, and I can mimic them as we saw last week. I can follow their example and I can take their advice and I can learn from them. That's part of the beauty of the body of Christ. We learn from each other and we model each other as we, and we'll come to this at the end again, uh, as each models Christ. That's the second thing. The third thing I want us to see this morning is exemplary minister, uh, ministers in teaching gospel morals or gospel conduct if you want it morals can sound a bit quaint in our day and age uh, but it's biblical biblical gospel principles gospel conduct gospel behavior and you see uh, again uh, there's been this suggestion we know Paul you know Paul's a clever guy and he was among you and he was there just um, doing his agenda and he was 
His agenda was immoral. And look at what Paul says. You are witnesses. You are witnesses. And you see, brethren, that's what puts the lie, puts the lie of the devil to bed immediately. When you and I can say, or others can say on our behalf, we are witnesses. This kind of thing did not happen in our congregation. This kind of thing is not true of our leaders or our members. You're witnesses. And God also. God is our witness. How devoutly and righteously um, and blamelessly we conducted ourselves. There is a slight difference in these words, but we shouldn't um, want to separate them like rooms in a house. But rather they're a bit like when we open the doors here and the doors there and the door, you just move from one to another. It's like one big room. And so devoutly means really before God, holy in a holy way. Righteously means, well, we also in doing that, it was a standard that people recognized in society. So we were living and reflecting good morals, good behavior in your society. We broke no law. Um, we were simply, we were confirming God's law and upholding the law of the community in which we were in. And then blamelessly, it's the idea as we've upheld God's law and the law of man, there's nobody that can raise an accusation or make something stick to us. There's not anything in our lives that somebody can match on to and say, well, there's such a clear major issue that that's what I'm talking about. Okay, get it? Paul says, our gospel morals, our gospel conduct, it was exemplary exemplary and he goes on to say then that um, it was on that basis then that we could say to you brethren you've now been converted to Christ you're no longer frequenting those Greek temples there's no longer going to be sexual immorality for you and you could see how in our lives there was no sexual immorality and same with other things you're not going to take wrongly what belongs to others. And so Paul would have gone through the commandments and said, there's only one God. There's one day of God. You keep this day. How do you relate to your parents? Well, here's what Greek society does. But here's what you do. You honor your parents. Um, here's Greek society. And you could have many wives. You as Christians, you have one wife. And you see Paul and uh, Timothy and, and Silas, they, they, they illustrated um, are these gospel morals, they came by example and by instruction. And I cannot emphasize how important that is. That within the church of Christ and brethren, you need to pray for us who are leaders. We are men of, with feet of clay, like you. There's no temptation that you have that doesn't come to us. And, but there's nothing more tragic and there's nothing that does more damage to the church of Christ than when there is immorality. And I mean that sexually, financially. I mean it in terms of the Lord's Day. I mean it in terms of all the commandments. When there is a lapse in those areas in the part of the leaders of the church. And there can be a, dis a divergence between what leaders teach and what leaders do. One of my saddest conversations that I've had from coming down to Skillen was is with someone who said they were a Christian. And they went to church. They were at meetings continually until they saw a, a diversion and a division between what the leaders taught and how 
the leaders lived. And this person said, I heard what I was to be, but I didn't see it in those who were saying it. And that person is, as far as I can tell, well, certainly they're nowhere today with regard to church. The very inconsistency turned them and turned their whole thinking upside down that they couldn't understand it. And brethren, Paul could say, we were exemplary ministers. And brethren, you're to be exemplary members in terms of morals, in terms of all ten commandments. And what you hear from uh, this pulpit and what you profess to be in this church You've got to be, and I've got to be, when we go out into the world. Men and women who are known to be men of truth and integrity, because our God and our Saviour is a God of truth and integrity. People who are not covetous, who are not out to get as much as we can, grab as much as we can of the world's goods. And sadly, sadly, Christians have often, often, been the worst example of that. And, but at the same time saying within church, no, no, I, Jesus Christ is my loyalty. So brethren, we are to be exemplary, not just as ministers, but we're to be exemplary members in um, exemplifying morals and teaching morals that honour Jesus Christ and honour people uh, because honouring Christ will always be best for people. And then finally this morning, let's see, producing, exemplary ministers in producing gospel models. Gospel models. You see, these religious or cultural teachers or social people that came around, they were about producing little mimics of themselves. So I like Aristotle, I'm a Plato man, and um, I'm a um, so on and so on. And uh, there were little minis of them, little miniatures. And that's so much what the world is today. But Paul says, um, as regards to you, brethren, we saw you um, becoming models of the gospel, as we sought to model the gospel. Look at what he says here in the verses. And we're looking now at verses 13 to 16. And I can only have a couple of minutes to finish uh, these, uh, this off. Um, Paul says, we thank God without ceasing. Why? Because you receive the word of God. As in truth it is the word of God. And then look at the end of verse 13. Which also energizes you who believe. This word of God is now the dynamic of your life. It's the engine that drives your life. And then verse 14, you became imitators. So it drives your life so that as people look at you, they see changed lives. Lives like the Christ that you profess. And what does that mean practically? Well, look at what it means practically. There are people who cherish the preached word. That's an exemplary Christian. Somebody who cherishes the preached word. Then the, the other thing that we see here is um, the exemplary Christian is someone who endures suffering and persecution and tribulation for the word. Look at verse 14. For you also suffered the same things. And then Paul says in the closing two verses, he says, um, we were model Christians and you're seeking to be, mod we're model preachers, sorry, and ministers, and we see you as model Christians. And here's what you need to realize, brother. Gospel models will encounter gospel opposition. Gospel models will encounter gospel opposition. And so Paul says at the end, he says, am I bothered about these people? And should you be bothered about them? He says, no. He says, because 
Do you know what they did in uh, back in the time of Christ, the time of the prophets? They did the same thing. And they're doing it now. And look at verse 15. They do not please God. That's very simple. Paul says, recognize who these opponents are. They are not pleasing God. They may say whatever they like. But watch what they're doing. They do not please God and are contrary to all men.